If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, and we're going to begin reading in verse 25. Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 25. The Bible says, Now there was with us seven brethren, and the first, when he married when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, resurrection, whose wife shall she be? Shall be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the Scriptures, right. nor the power of God. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank You and praise You for another opportunity to be in Your house, to preach Your Word, Lord, to share the truth that You've said before us. Lord God, this morning we pray that You would meet with us. We need that. Uh, we need You to fill the house and we need, need for You to deal with sinners in a certain situation. Lord, we pray that you would uh, deal with the redeemed, Lord, that we might be drawn closer to you, that we might uh, have a better understanding of how powerful and how wonderful you really are. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, now, uh, very familiar verses of Scripture, and we're going to be preaching this morning on the power of God. Now, I would dare say that most of us lack understanding of the power of God and, and the reason it is is the entrapment of the flesh. Now, even the redeemed, uh, I don't think we should understand, I mean, I don't think we understand the power of God like we should because we've boxed Him into a corner and, and we, we make thoughts and statements, well, that was the Old Testament, that was in the apostolic period, and all these things... And, and listen, the very first principle that you have to remember is nothing, nothing, nothing limits the power of God. Uh, I mean, His power is ceaseless. It's amazing. It's beyond our understanding. So when someone tries to say, well, that doesn't happen anymore, you can mark it down. There's a problem somewhere because God doesn't change. Uh, so uh, with that thought, we'll go back and look very briefly at the text and the group that came before the the Lord God the Lord Jesus on this occasion was the Jewish uh, Sanhedrin and they wanted to stump Jesus up now the reason they wanted to trump him up and and to mix everybody up number one he had a great following and if possible they wanted to end that following and the second thing is this he was a very uh, a very uneducated man in the flesh that's why he always amazed them at his knowledge of the scriptures because he wasn't an educated man he, he didn't have uh, the uh, schooling that they had and so uh, they thought this was a way to reduce the person of who he was. Now, uh, you're familiar with the, the way they tried to trick him up. And, and they made this uh, story of a man uh, that buried a woman and he died. And as was the Jewish custom, and it was not a law, but they treated it as a law. As was the Jewish custom... He, the, the second son got the wife, and then the third son got the wife, on down to the end, just like the Bible says. Now, uh, they thought they would trip him up with what? The law. That, um, that they would say, okay, whose is she? Now, a uh, couple of things on that, and the Lord Jesus makes it very clear, it's just there's not even any... There's neither male nor female when we get there. So uh, it's an immaterial thing. And uh, then, you, you know, I, I'll say this for some falsehoods out there. Uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that's what they call themselves. They're Mormons. Uh, they're Smithites. Their first leader was Smith. And uh, they say that that's why they have so many wives that in the resurrection, 
section, our families will still be known. They will not. Not as they're known now. We won't understand uh, male and female. We won't understand that. And, and, and so the next time you think about that, or if you ever, ever encounter one of them with the black tie and the white shirt and the black pants on, bas on bicycles, you remind them of this scripture because it's simply not true. And, and so we find then, at this situation, the Jews' desire was to trip up the Lord Jesus and, and catch Him in something. The second part of verse 29, the Lord Jesus uh, answers, and He begins with this, You do err, or you make an error. You make a mistake. Something is not correct. Something is not right. You know, when you're taking a, a test, or back when I was a teacher and I was checking tests, if the answer wasn't correct, I would mark it with a red X. And, and if it was a, if it's what I thought would be needful for the student, I would write in why they got the wrong answer. You know, uh, sometimes we need that, don't we? We need it to be written in and said, I know you were thinking this, but this was what was really going on. And he says, so you do err. You, you make a mistake. And, and you know, uh, I don't think there's any larger mistake that we as the Lord's people could, could make than not to understand the God we serve. What could be a greater error? What could be a, a more horrific mistake? You do err, first of all, not knowing the Scriptures. Now... This book is not difficult to understand with the help of the Holy Spirit, but just reading it, you know what this book is written on a third grade level. Uh, it, that, that was the design of the, of the translators so that people like you and I could understand what they were reading. They didn't make it complicated. They made the context simple. And that way we could understand it. So first of all, he's saying to these very, uh, very notable, educated men, you can get it messed up. You do err. You made a mistake. Why did you make a mistake? Because you don't know the Scriptures. So the first thing that we can do to avoid, learn the Scriptures. Study them daily. Get in there. And I know that very few people in the modern day, and now I'm grouping myself in that, uh, we don't pull down the Scripture, but we get our phones out. And, and that's fun. I, I get texts every day of friends who share Scripture, and I'll read their Scripture, and, 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 and that's fun. But however you're getting it, read it daily. Get in there. Uh, when me and Donna married, my grandfather's uh, sister, Aunt Chloe, got us a Bible, and she was very old by then. You barely could read it because her writing had, had failed her. But she said, for Larry and Donna, please read daily. You know what? That was good advice. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that was good advice. And, and so we see then as the Lord's people uh, that we can mess up because the Sanhedrin messed up as well. Now, secondly, I want you to see that the Lord gives them this. You don't understand the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Now, do you understand the power of God? And if you do, or if you do to some point, how did you come to that? How, how do you understand the level of the power of God that you do know? And, and if you, there's two ways, and we'll see through the Scriptures, there's two ways you'll learn the power of God. Number one is from the Scripture. And number two, and far, far more effective is by experience. Yeah. Those are the two ways that you will learn of the power of God. And listen, you will never understand the power of God any other way. So, uh, if you haven't had life experience to teach you the power of God yet, you get in those Scriptures and you dig and you find. Now, with that said, I also want to say this. Unless the Scripture is telling you that it's a parable, just believe it's what it says it is. That you, you, you know why you know why that uh, we fail in the modern day to understand the power of God like we should 
is because we'll say, well, that's just an example. Mm -hmm. No, it, it literally happened. So thereby, it must be the power of God, right? Uh, it, it, it's for our betterment. You know what? I would a whole lot rather uh, to trust the God that could come out on a ship and say, peace be still, and the storm stop immediately than that being a type to tell me something. Don't you? Don't you think that I, I would rather... Uh, I would rather be able to serve the one that can keep me walking on water than that being just a type of going over the troubles of this life. No, I'd rather know that it's the real deal, hadn't you? You know what? If God wills it so, I fully believe this, I could walk across the Cumberland River. I really do. If He wills it so, because you know what? His power is not changed. And you know, you know, you know what's changed? We've changed. And we're so scared of looking apostolic. That, that, that is the problem, is it not? And, and, and so then we as Lord's people, instead of uh, saying we have the power of, a part of the apostles, simply focus on what Christ did. Now go with me to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Uh, verse 22. Romans chapter 9, uh, verse 22. The Bible says this, What if God, willing to shew His wrath and to make His power known, endured much long suffering with the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? Now, I want you to see the middle part of that verse says to make His power known. So, how is He revealing His power? Waiting on the vessels of destruction. In other words, He hasn't poured out His fury because He wants to teach us in the here and now. What He want to teach us? About His power. About His abilities. About His strength. About what He can do. And so that's why He hasn't returned yet. Talking about the second coming of Christ. I believe it's near too. But you know what? In the interim between here and when the Lord Jesus steps out on the, on the clouds. I want to learn something about the power of God. Now when I say that. Think about this. When the Lord saved your soul. He saved your soul. And you knew God. But you know what? You didn't know about God. There's a huge difference, is there not? Uh, and you know how you learn about God? Continue to study and learn by experience. Well, watch what other people have experienced. And when they come out on the other side of that, we need to simply believe it. Now go with me to 2 Timothy. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter number 3 in the first verse. Uh, for me, a verse of Scripture. This is a true saying if a man desire the office of a bishop or a pastor, he desireth the good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good, of good behavior, given to hospitality and apt to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, uh, a filthy lucre, but, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, but patient, not a brawler, nor covetousness, of one that ruleth his own house well, having the children, having his children in subject with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now, that is not the verse I wanted, but I wanted to uh, I, I, I wanted to finish that reading because the Lord must have been in it. Go with me to Psalm 66. Psalm 66 in the very first verse. Psalm 66 in the very first verse. The Bible says this. Make a joyful noise unto uh, God, all ye lands. Sing forth the honor of His name. Make His praise glorious. Say unto God... How terrible is thy works. Now, as, uh, as the psalmist is writing here, he, he makes a number of things about praising God. Make a joyful noise. And, um, you know, that's whatever you can do. 
Uh, what I had found after 25 plus years of trying to serve the Lord, that I make a better preacher than a singer. So my joyful noise is simply to preach the gospel and, and lead to singing to somebody that can do it, right? Make a joyful noise. Now, with that said, remember this, there's something that you can do or He would not give a general command to make a joyful noise, right? So there's something that must be done or He would have never told His people as a general to be able to do that. Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands, sing forth the honor of His name, make His praise glorious. Now, I want you to see in that last phrase of verse 2, it says, make His praise glorious. Now, that means glorifying to God. Now, I love Southern gospel music, the older stuff. I, I, I've reached a point in my life where the new stuff don't even hardly make sense to me. But, with that said, those people, the ones even that I like, a lot of times what they enjoy is the glory of self. <laughs> what they like is being to be looked at. What they like is this. And what should be happening, what their praise should be, the center of what they do is shedding light on the person of Christ. That's what glory means. It simply means light. Like the light you have above you this morning. You shine on Christ and you shine for Christ. That, that's what really worship is truly about. When you, uh, when, you, when you look at it in its context, that's what worship is for. Verse 3, Say unto God... How terrible are thy works. So the first thing that we, uh, we find about the power of God is that it's terrible. Now, the problem with that word is we put a lot of negative connotations to it. The modern English puts that as a bad thing, you know. Somebody said, well, Larry, how's your day been? Well, it's been terrible. Now, the, immediately, uh, the immediate context of that is I've had a bad day. But really what terrible means is that it's been extraordinary and powerful. Now, there might be some bad things that attach. And I said, like, you know, what you're really saying, there's been some powerful negative things in my life. But you know what? Our God is terrible. That means endless Power. That means His ability never ends. His ability is a terrible thing. And we need to praise Him for it because there's no, there's no context for that. No, no limiting Him. Say unto God, how terrible are thy works through the greatness of thy power. This is the result. Shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. So, the first thing about his great power is that the enemy is always under snuff. He's always under the thumb. And just like this boy that walked in and killed those four people at Waffle House, you know what? Whatever David's got a hold of that boy, God's greater. Uh, you know, what, what, whatever situation you face tomorrow, the, mo the most horrific thing you might think of, God is greater. You know, uh, uh, you know uh, when my sister died a few years ago, and you know, the, who I really felt sorry for that, because see, after Judy died, there was no feeling sorry for Judy. Who I really felt sorry for is my mother. Losing a child, I can't imagine how horrific that would be. But, you know, what I've learned through that is my God is greater. Yeah. He, he's better. You know what? And even today, uh, what my mother will tell you, I couldn't have got through it without my Lord. See, that's a terrible, wonderful power, isn't it? Something that can sustain you when nothing else can. <clears throat> That's the power that I want. And, and you know what? It's easy to say, uh, praise the Lord and glory to God when we're talking about a spiritual context. But what do you do when you begin to think about it in a physical context? Uh, if you want a physical context, I'll give you this. The widow's barrel never ran out. 
That is a terrible, mighty God. Is it not? And, and you know what? We would have liked, we would have been like the belly aching Jews and, and sick of mine. You, you know, uh, I, I like fried cornbread. I like cornbread even while you fix it. But after three and a half years, we'd be burnt out on it, wouldn't you? Uh, something that I really don't like, I'll eat it, I'll eat anything. That's just my nature. But I really don't like pizza. I got so burnt out on it in college, I just don't like it. But you know what? If I had the choice between two years of going without anything and two years of pizza, I'll have to go with pizza. Yeah. Right? And, and unlike most of the uh, of the uh, children of Israel when they were belly aching about the manna, here we find some centuries later, and Elijah, you know what? Elijah or the widow or her son, there's no documentation whatsoever that they got, I wove this bread. They must have liked it. And, and, and beyond that, you know what? This is the real thing. They were content with it. Yeah. See, we live in a very discontented day, do we not? We live in a day where simply, uh, seemingly no one is satisfied with what the Lord God's given them. Given them. And you know what? That, that's a pretty miserable way to live. And so we find then that um, our God's power puts our enemies beneath us. Uh, look with, in Psalms 150, just a little further over. The 150th Psalm, the, the last one. The first verse. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him in the, the firmament of His power. Now, you know, uh, this firmament has a lot of me uh, uh, meanings in the Bible. When you, when you think of firmament in creation, it meant areas. Different spots. Because, you know, it said there, the, He divided the firmament. And, uh, but in this context, permanent means uh, something totally different. It means presentation. You praise Him in His presentation. You know what? If God were to show up this morning and He was to deal with people and He was to thrill your soul, that's the firmament that He's presented Himself and you are to give Him praise for it. Yeah. Uh, if, if, you are, if you are in the hospital and God brings a divine feeling, that is your firmament. If He brings a divine healing to you when sickness is on, that's your situation. That's your firmament. And you know what? That's where He's placed you. So give Him praise for it. You know what? Uh, we are very discontent on the general where He placed you. You know what I'm saying? You know what? Uh, boys were hassling me a little bit before service about my big 5-0 that's coming at the end of the year. And uh, I just simply have to say this. Uh, that's my firmament. And so I'm going to find something to praise God about. You know what? If you ever get you a pink slip and you don't have a job, that's your firmament. And you praise God for it. See, that's the most hard thing you'll ever do is praise Him in whatever situation that He places you in. And, and, and the next time the tide's moving in the wrong direction, just remember, remember this, when things is hard and the money's gone and you don't have anything uh, really left in your mind to do, that God is all-powerful. And even the direction the wind's blowing, if it's blowing cold right in your face, that He guides that. Yeah. And give Him praise for it. Yeah. Lift Him up for it. And so then we as the Lord's people, we need to be reminded almost constantly uh, of the very situation that God deserves our praise irregardless. 
And, and so one way that he, he presents his power is in the firmament that he's placed you in. In that spot where you dwell. The Gospel of Luke. Luke one thirty five. The Gospel of Luke chapter 1, uh, verse 35, uh, fairly familiar verses of Scripture. Now Mary has been informed that she would be the mother of the Almighty. You know what? That You talk about an all-powerful, difficult to understand thing. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the, the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also the holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now I want you to notice a number of things, and, and I think it's in, uh, uh, in, in, in Psalms, uh, or Isaiah maybe, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Now, you know, the filthiness of the Catholic religion will tell you that there was actually something intimate between God and Mary. Listen, that's blasphemous. Uh, that, 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 you know, that's about as ungodly as you can get. Yeah. And, uh, but I want you to see there was power that came on Mary mm -hmm. and the power placed a child in her womb. Mm -hmm. And literally, that is what happened. You know, that's a, that's a power of God. Can you imagine some, uh, an individual just spontaneously becoming a widow? That, that's the God that we serve. Now, we've got a lot of babies in the congregation, and you know what? They're sweet and they're precious, especially my grandchildren. And... Um, but they came by natural means, did they not? And, and, and so to find that all that could be defied and everything that we understand about genetics being set aside and the Almighty speaking, touching, placing a, uh, a fully sinless creature into uh, at least fleshly existence. He existed for eternity. It, it, it's just unbelievable. And, and you know, uh, I do believe that's a miracle that will never be repeated. But it's only because that's God's plan, not that He couldn't do it. Uh, but that, that, that's just uh, that's a mind -boggling. And maybe it's just because I have a very analytical mind and I think about all that I was taught in human anatomy in college. And it, it amazes me that my God can do those things, but He did. He, 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 he literally uh, defied all laws of biology and created an individual in and of Himself completely out of His goodness. That's an amazing thing. Gospel of Luke chapter 9. The Gospel of Luke chapter 9, verse 40. Luke 9 and uh, verse 40, the Bible says this, And I, I besought thy disciples to cast him, meaning a demon, out, and they could not. And Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, now, I want you to notice that in this verse you find two items that are going to hinder you in understanding the power of God. And the first one is the lack of faith. Now, we always think of, because the flesh is what the flesh is, we always think of faith in the context of the flesh. I have faith that God can do this. Or maybe in the Spirit, I have faith. But you know what? Real faith moves you to something. Simply saying, I have faith in Christ. You know what? I can say that I am six foot tall and uh, still have the body of a 20 year old, but that just don't make it true. And just saying you have faith 
doesn't make it true. That's why, that, that's why James wrote, I'll show you. I'll show you with my works. You know, everybody wants to get down on James and even to the point of calling him a Campbellite. But see, this is the thing. James understood if it didn't impact his life, what could he claim as faith? And, and, and so we find here that if we really want to experience with God and we want to experience and understand even just a little bit about the power of God, about His ability, that we're going to have to deal with this thing called faith. Oh, faithless and perverse. Now, the second item there is what's going to hinder your faith, and that is the generation which we live in. It is a perverse, sickening time to live. And it will bear on you, it will beat you up, it will wear you down uh, when you're out in it day by day by day. And believe me, I know it. Uh, working where I work, listen, you get a bunch of, of veterans together, they can be the most foul mouthed, ungodly people you've ever been around. And uh, you know what? Just because I don't take in with them don't mean it don't wear on me. We live in a perverse generation. You know what? When men are marrying men and women are marrying women, listen, that's a perverse generation. Uh, them two sodomite women took them babies they adopted and drove off a cliff with them. You know what? That's perverse. That's just unbelievable. And you know what? It'll wear on you after a while. And so if we want to experience the full power of God, you know, uh, uh, we've always taught separation and it's a wonderful doctrine. But as I go along the way, I think I've learned this. The reason for separation is not that your hair will be long and that your dress will be like a become to a godly woman. It's so that we're not involved with this world and we can experience God. Experience the power of God. That's the reason that we're to be separate. And you know what? And, and I'm not suggesting this. That's really why the Amish lifestyle is so separate. Is because they don't want to be involved with the world. That makes sense, don't it? And, 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 and so then we as the Lord's people, if we want to experience God in some measure then at least, we've got to limit this perverseness. Faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? He asked him a question. This was about mid-ministry, mid, mid and he was worried they weren't going to get it before he left. You know, how long? How many times do I have to show you? Bring thy son hither. And as he was yet coming, the devil threw him down, always destructive, and tear him. Now I think that's interesting. And we'll, we'll move on very quickly. Um, throwing him down. I can see. because the devil, But it said that he tear him. He, he ripped him. <clears throat> now. Did he rip himself. Like I just did. Or did the devil come and just scratch him. I don't know. It, says that, it said he. I mean still talking about the demon right. He threw him down and tear him, scratched him, opened him up. That's, that's something to consider, isn't it? That, that's something to think about, that the, the demons are that, that powerful and all around us at all times. And, he, and as he was yet coming, the devil threw him down and tear him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit. Now, I want you to see that it's singular. And then you think about Mary Magdalene, who had seven. And you think about Legion, who had many. So one evil spirit did this. The un and rebuked the unclean spirit, and healed the child, and delivered him again to his father. And they were all amazed by the mighty powers of God. But while they wondered, everyone at this thing which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, let those sayings sink down into the, to your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. Now, I want you to see 
what, what accomplished this is the power of God. Now, in the modern day, I guess it happened down at Franklin, do we see demonic possession? Sure we do. Can we still see people flowing themselves on the floor? Sure. Uh, the reason we don't is unfortunately those people go in a different direction. I'll give you two, two ideas. Number one, they stay in the world. And number two, unfortunately, they go to a Catholic priest. And the reason why, we as the Lord's true church is going to address things like that, do we? So to think about it, is not. And, and, and so then we, <clears throat> we as the Lord's people find that God's power, the, first, the second thing we understand about His power is it's over all. The demons are at His, is under His foot at all times and they must be obedient. And the reason I say they must be obedient is because they're just fallen angels themselves and they, they have no choice but to be obedient. Romans chapter uh, 1 uh, verse 16. Romans 1 and verse 16 the Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, I want you to see the next power that we see is salvation. And, and, and you know, the security of the believer or everlasting redemption, however you want to phrase that, is, is a hated doctrine. But this is the thing about the security of the believer. Is your salvation based on you or is it based on the work of God? Because see, what keeps me secure even today, 35 years later, is the power of God. And so if you say that you can lose your salvation again, you're not doubting yourself, you're doubting God. And you're doubting, doubting the ability of God. And, and so we then as the Lord's people need to understand and know that yes, our salvation is fully uh, secure and the reason it is secure is that our God is, is fully and completely powerful. Last place in 1 Peter. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 5. The Bible says this, who are kept He's talking to the redeemed who are kept, how? By the power of God. That's it. The next time that someone questions you and makes fun of you because you believe the, the doctrine of, uh, uh, of everlasting salvation, bring them to that. Because see, what they'll have to question in the end is the power of God. <laughs> Right? So, this morning, what do you believe about the power of God? You know, uh, girls and children, I guess I should say, uh, they were studying Sarah, presenting the, the story of Daniel in the lines. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, Gracie showed me her picture and Bella showed me her picture. And, uh, you know, the uh, Bible says this. Daniel said, My God had closed the mouths of the lion. Uh, you know what? He can still do that today. Yeah, you know, uh, lions are very ferocious beasts and they kept them hungry. And the lions did, so that they, they would they would devour as soon as they came in. And you know what? I've often thought about this concerning Daniel. And yet, I mean, the Lord God locked the jaws of the lion. But you know what else that the lion has on the end of its hand? And a lot of times, that's what they kill the prey with is the claws. See, they they were under God's dominion too. 
and, and all things are under God's dominion. Uh, and we simply have, you know what, dig for it. Look for it. In every situation in your life, you look for that. When it's good, when it's bad, just look at how powerful God is. And we give you praise for it.